This is part two of our case study on um, Tyrone Hayes's work studying this um, compound atrazine and its effects on frogs. We ended in the last case part of the case study um, looking at the replicate study that was done um, by another scientist, um, either James or John Carr. The Syngenta press release quotes James Carr. Now we have no idea whether it's James or John head of the Texas Tech team as saying, we have been unable to reproduce the low concentration effects of atrazine on amphibians reported elsewhere in the scientific literature. This statement refers to Hayes's results. And then I would have you comment on the accuracy of this statement and explain your reasoning. So when you're thinking the low concentration effects, they're saying nothing about the high concentration effects where they did get larger amounts of frogs in some of those experiencing a higher percentage of gonadal abnormalities. But at the low concentration effects, they're talking about those controls, right? So um, Hayes had no abnormalities in his controls and uh, Carr had a significant percent of abnormalities. I say significant, but that has an actual meaning of abnormalities in his controls. So that's the big difference that they're talking about here and that they were unable to reproduce it. So they're saying basically um, that Hayes' study was wrong. The Hayes study was conducted using water samples collected from ponds and streams in agricultural and non-agricultural regions of the Midwest. The study conducted by Carr's group added varying amounts of atrazine to dechlorinated laboratory water. Which set of experimental conditions, if either, would be more likely to lead to valid experimental results? Explain your reasoning. So here you're thinking about lab versus field. Both have important implications for the results of your study. In a lab setting, you are ideally controlling for all of the variables um, except the one that you are varying yourself, right? So they, in Carr's study, have controlled for everything and are just changing the amount of atrazine. There's nothing else in the water that could be interacting with that atrazine. However, that is nothing like what these frogs would be experiencing in the field. Hayes study collected samples from ponds and streams, so water that's going to contain uh, a multitude of maybe other organisms, other chemicals, um, something that would be reflective of what those uh, frogs would be experiencing in their natural environment. So this is a big debate um, or a big consideration within um, the production of scientific studies is lab results being applicable to the field and field results um, having so many potential interacting variables that it's difficult to piece apart. I also want to note that this is information that I got from the case study. Um, however, I cannot find, and this is possibly me just skipping over it continually as I read the paper, the source of the water for the Hayes study. What is the significance of the CAR data that reports the percent of male frogs having gonadal abnormalities at a nominal atrazine concentration of zero micrograms per liter. So this is asking about the controls. How, what is the significance of CARS controls having gonadal abnormalities? So think about that. So Hayes got fired, right? But he kept investigating because He's a scientist, he has a curious mind, and he wasn't scared. Or maybe if he was scared, he was brave, right? Um, this article is a pretty interesting summary of all of this stuff that happened in this Hayes versus Syngenta um, interaction that you know happened over the course of like a decade. So Hayes keeps studying, um, he's still working at Berkeley. Uh, he's not getting his funding from Syngenta, now he's just working through his lab. So. We're looking at the frequency of occurrence of gonadal abnormalities in male frogs collected at various sites in the population with gonadal abnormalities. So here we have frogs that were collected in the field from a variety of different sites. These sites don't correspond with the atrazine concentration at each of these sites in order, right? The sites are numbered um, potentially based on their location or when they were sampled, but they're not arranged in order of atrazine concentration. So let's just write what their concentrations were. This one is 0.14. This one, oops, skipped one. This one's 0.2. This one's also 0.2. This one's 0.3. This 
this one's 0 0.8, this one's 0 0.7, and this one's 0.5. So if we were to put these in order of atrazine concentration, we would just have to sneak those two in there, right? Again, we're not really seeing a trend. If anything, we have this sort of bell-shaped curve, um, which could be just random, that at this sort of medium concentration of 0.2, we would have this high amount. But again, this is also 0.2. So whatever's going on here, it's not a linear trend in more atrazine equals more abnormalities. There's atrazine at all of these sites, and there's abnormalities at all of these sites. However, we don't have this um, nice correlation between our variables. So this is hard to say anything about, except for the fact that presence of atrazine seems to correlate with presence of gonadal abnormalities in Hayes's studies. Both Hayes and a Syngenta-supported group conducted laboratory studies to determine whether the testosterone level in the blood of male frogs was altered by the presence of atrazine in the water in which they grew. In these studies, larvae were grown until they reached sexual maturity in water containing an atrazine concentration of 25 micrograms per liter. For control purposes, both of these studies grew larvae in water containing a nominal, supposed atrazine concentration of zero parts per billion. The graph shown below, or on the next slide, indicates the results obtained by the two studies. So what does this mean? We have larvae that are grown in a concentration of 25 micrograms per liter, which is the high end of those past experiments, right? We were looking at um, very low doses before, low concentrations. And then we have controls that are grown with no atrazine. So we are comparing this high-end dose to controls with no atrazine exposure. So these are the results for both studies. The Hayes data is on the left in the black bars, and the Hecker data is in the striped bars on the right. So if we look at what this is telling us, we have for Hayes' study control males, control males or not control males, control males, males with atrazine doses of 25 uh, micrograms per liter, and then control females. So the males who had no atrazine exposure had testosterone levels at four nanograms per milliliter in their blood. So pretty high compared to all of these other ones, right? Males who were exposed to 25 parts per billion so that's that um, 25 uh, micrograms per liter concentration, have very low testosterone levels in their blood compared to, relative to the controls, right? So we would assume that this would be the normal state of these frogs, and this is the state when they have this high atrazine exposure. These male frogs with atrazine exposure are producing less testosterone or have less testosterone in their blood than the control females. If we look at the Hecker data, they get very similar results for their atrazine exposed frogs. They're just about the same. However, big difference with their control males. Here we see very little difference between the control males and the males exposed to atrazine, but if you compare results between these studies, their control males have the same amount of testosterone as the control females in Hayes' study. So what is going on here? In its evaluation of the data reported in the Hecker study, the EPA noted that the controls used in this study were not free of atrazine, but were in fact found to contain atrazine levels comparable to those in the 0.1 parts per billion treatment level. So remember that at the 0.1 parts per billion, that's 0.1 micrograms per liter, there were effects on gonadal um, formation, right? There were abnormalities. So even at that low dose, um, we were seeing effects. It was, there were effects at 0.01. So if there are controls that have even the smallest amount of atrazine, that makes that particular study completely invalid, right? And so those controls that had very low compared to Hayes' controls, um, even low compared to the females, right? Um, 
So that would mean that that atrazine exposure was potentially the reason for the low blood testosterone. No atrazine was found in the controls used in the Hayes study. And this Steger 2003 is, um, I think, some kind of audit or um, work by the EPA. Steger was an EPA employee. So they looked at um, the validity of those two studies. This is a picture of Hayes from the article written in the New Yorker. I recommend that you read it. Um, it really goes into the complexity of this saga, of this relationship between Hayes and Syngenta. And you can see while reading it, you know, Hayes is not blameless in this situation. Um, however, he, I don't know, reacted in a very, a way that isn't unreasonable, right? He's being targeted by this major com company. It's very scary, and they're trying to discredit him. And there's no evidence for him to show people about that. He just knows because he sees them at his meetings. He sees this stuff going on. Um, and, you know, him as a kind of the face of science, um, this kind of stuff you don't see happening to, you know, white men who look like scientists. It happens to women and people of color, right? So just to kind of frame this all, um, and I wanted to highlight something from that article. So there was a lawsuit against Syngenta where they um, had to reveal a lot of their internal documents. And from that lawsuit, it uncovered a bunch of information about their meetings and um, work they had been doing on Hayes. So I'll just read from it. Um, where am I starting here? So the company documents show that while Hayes was studying atrazine, Syngenta was studying him as he had long suspected. Syngenta's public relations team had drafted a list of four goals. The first was discredit Hayes. In a spiral bound notebook, Syngenta's communication manager, Sherry Ford, who referred to Hayes by his initials, wrote that the company could prevent citing of TH data by revealing him as non-credible. He was a frequent topic of conversations at company meetings. Syngenta looked for ways to exploit Hayes' faults and problems, and these are in quotes. If TH involved in scandal, Enviros will drop him, Ford wrote. She observed that Hayes grew up in world, S.C., which is South Carolina, that wouldn't accept him, and needs adulation, doesn't sleep, was scarred for life. These are all in quotes. She wrote, what's motivating Hayes? Basic question. So they're trying to like figure him out and take him down personally and professionally. Uh, Syngenta, which is based in Basel, sells more than $14 billion worth of seeds and pesticides a year and funds research at some 400 academic institutions around the world. When Hayes agrees to do experiments for the company, which at the time was part of a larger corporation, Novartis, the students in his lab expressed concern that biotech companies were buying up universities and that university funding would compromise the, or industry funding would compromise the objectiv objectivity of their research. Hayes assured them that his fee um, would make their lab more rigorous. And so he's like going into it with this idea that, you know, I'm just painting the picture with the data and they can do with it what they want. Another piece of information that was revealed in those lawsuit documents was that when Hayes applied for a job at Duke, um, which is really close to the headquarters of Syngenta in the US, that Syngenta um, contacted a dean at Duke and let them know about the state of the relationship between Dr. Hayes and Syngenta. And they had given a small endowment, um, small in the sense of industry, to Duke. So Hayes didn't end up getting that job. Other information that was revealed uh, was that they had a strategy to keep atrazine on the market until at least 2010. A PowerPoint presentation assembled by Syngenta's global production manager explained that we need atrazine to secure our position in the corn marketplace. Without atrazine, we cannot defend and grow our business in the USA. Sherry Ford, the communications manager, wrote in her notebook that the company should not phase out atrazine until we know about this other um, herbicide called Paraquat that they're making that was um, potentially associated with Parkinson's disease. She noted that atrazine focuses attention away from other products to which she's referring to that um, other potentially uh, disease-causing herbicide that they're making. More notes about Hayes were in um, Ford's notebook to ask journals to retract his work, to have his work audited by a third party, to set a trap to entice him to sue, to investigate his funding, to investigate his wife. So many notes about how to discredit him. Um, 
They also got a list of all of his appearances, his schedule, and would then try to go attend those meetings to um, have, quote unquote, systemic rebuttals of all TH appearances. So they would plant people in the audience to try to discredit him and ask questions to point out potential errors in his um, statements. So there's evidence of this targeted attack on Hayes, and I can't find it in this paper. I think I read it somewhere else, so don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that Syngenta bought Tyrone Hayes's name associated with particular search terms, so that if you search Tyrone Hayes, it would come up as Tyrone Hayes discredited, um, and so just many kind of uh, attacks to kind of get them from all sides. So this is kind of the state of the world of science, is that it is intimately tied to money. And so you got to know how to interpret information and how to um, look for funding sources. And this is this is the age we live in and we need to understand what's going on.